There we go. Levi, when you're ready, please. Awesome. Welcome everyone. We are doing a class here for Charm City Filmmakers. We're going to be talking about the importance of action lines. Action lines are, you know, the things that come in between your dialogue. Um, uh, what are what are some uh, directors and writers that are famous for their dialogue? Um, Aaron Sorkin, Quentin Tarantino. Sorkin, perfect perfect example. Very very quick. Scorsese. Yeah. Scorsese has a has some great di great dialogue in his films. Mm, Godfather. Yeah, even even uh, guys like Coppola as well have all of these uh, all this great dialogue and stuff. I would also put in people like Quentin Tarantino is known for his dialogue. He's known for his asides and these really quick snappy things. Howard Hawks had phenomenal dialogue in his films with the overlapping and it kept a realistic kind of kinetic tone. Now, name for me people who are good at writing action lines. Hmm. Well, we never get to see them. Exactly. You <laughs> never get to see them. They're not on screen. As, as people who still love film, we don't really see action lines unless you read the script. And for most people's purposes, you don't need to. The purpose of a script is to get something on screen. The problem is, is that the audience isn't the only person you're trying to sell to. When you present someone a script, a script serves two purposes. It is simultaneously a storytelling device, and it is also a technical document. So you are telling a story to the people around you, and you are telling that story to someone who may be funding the picture, but it's also a technical document, something that a crew and your actors and everyone else can read and kind of get a feel for what all is needed. And the action lines is what guides it. You can have phenomenal dialogue and you can have a, some really witty banter. But unfortunately, if your actors don't know what they're supposed to be doing in any given scene, there isn't the direction. They don't really know what a character is like or how they're acting. You're still kind of dead in the water. Action lines are incredibly important. So let's, let's jump to our little presentation that I've put together. So there's that. And let's start the formal slideshow. Start from the beginning. There we are. So I've called this regarding action and why what's in between your dialogue matters. So I've, I've explained to you that these are, why these are important and how this sort of uh, ties things together a little bit more. You need something in between your dialogue. You need to give uh, people direction as far as your actors go, as far as your camera goes, and everything else. A script is a technical document and a storytelling document. So let's look at a... At a at a brief example, this was uh, something that I wrote up real fast, just to kind of give us an idea of your basic action line. Uh, somebody read that for me. I'll do it. I'll read it. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Jeff Hem, late thirties, walks through his front door, but there's something that that's in the way. I'm sorry, that's a technical on my action. I have just. Who's talking? Uh, Zoom calls um, everybody. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I, 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 can, I can oh. get it up. Uh, okay. I'll say, I'll start with Jeff, Jeff. Jeff Mayo. Mayo, late 30s, walks through his front door and closes it behind him. He sets down his keys. He sits down at the kitchen table. His phone begins to ring. He frowns at it. Okay. Pretty simple piece of action. So what does that say about the scene? So what, what is happening here? Uh, he's getting home from something. Yeah. So we have, and, uh, and due to uh, how scripting works, typically what is in the brackets there 
male, late 30s. It's a quick description of what the character is like, typically the first time they are introduced in the script. So this is our character introduction. This is our introduction to this person. What do we know other than male, late 30s? He owns keys. He owns keys, correct. And he's in the kitchen. He is in a kitchen. Phenomenal. We. So, what is the tone of this scene? Well, he's he's um, when he says he, the phone when the phone begins to ring, he frowns at it. So he's maybe expecting something not so great. Or a um, robocall. Yeah, <laughs> it could be it could be any number of things. So, the thing is, is that this is serviceable. It gets the job done. It it allows the blocking to, for the actors to take place. And it also allows uh, your cinematographer to kind of know, know what's going on as well. But it doesn't really serve the purpose of the story itself. So you have it as a technical document covered, but not from a storytelling perspective as something that you're trying to tell, say a studio head or a producer or even uh, for your actors as far as where they are emotionally. So it gets the job done, but you're missing one half of, uh, of what makes a script. So let's try this on for size. So I'll, do, I'll just uh, Would you like read, me to read, read it fast. You had a volunteer. Yeah. This is Ted. I can read it. Okay, go for it. Interior apartment. Jeff trudges sleepily through his apartment front door. He turns, lightly grips the knob, and closes it. He drops his keys, wallet, phone, etc. into the basket by the door, which is crowded by other small things that have found their way into it, his pockets over the years. He makes his way to the table, a hand-me-down from his parents upon moving away from his home in Idaho out to the big city. He plops into one of the equally ruddy chairs, exhausted from the day's work. Jeff's 38, not as spry as he was in his early 20s, and his job as a copyist took far more out of him than usual. His gray slacks, rumpled white shirt, and striped tie all look disheveled after a hard day. His phone starts ringing. It's his mother, ready for her weekly call. Jeff sighs and frowns. He doesn't have time for this and is far too tired. Okay, so what does that sound like to everyone? So does that give us a little bit more of an idea of what the scene is doing? Yes. Though it is a yes. lot of detail. It sounds like a novel. Exactly. So it's too much. What, we, what we have here is something that is serving story, but not technical. This gives us a really good idea of who Jeff is, how Jeff is coming home, maybe why he's upset, and all of these other aspects of it. This gives us tone. And this gives us a, a feeling for an actor to follow. And even as a reader, it fulfills uh, us uh, putting a, excuse me, it fulfills our need to feel in a character's shoes. The problem is, is that it is a massive block of text. It's a lot of stuff. So if you are, if you are your cinematographer, or if your actor is trying to just know, know their beats fairly quickly, what am I focusing on? What am I focusing on? I'm trying okay. to just read through this quickly. Some of, some of you, I, I can't see all of your cameras, there are times when you read something like this and people's eyes start kind of glazing over. And I can almost guarantee you, if any of you that have read scripts before, when you see a chunk of text like this, you skim it. It's not conducive. It doesn't really work all that great. So the problem I find with a lot of new writers, there's rarely an in-between. They're either very sparse and utilitarian, giving only essential details, or they're incredibly verbose. They're writing a novel, essentially. Both of these are useful skills. Don't get me wrong. We need both of them. There's a time to be brief and there's a time to be verbose. But 
often it's all or nothing. So it's either really sparse or it's just paragraphs of description in between your dialogue. And no matter how good your dialogue is, if you are, if you either can't really paint a scene and I'm not really getting a feeling for your characters and how they're described and how I'm supposed to imagine them, well, things can feel a little bit rushed. The pace can be all over the place. If there's too much, I'm just going to start skimming things and I'm going to start uh, missing vital details. It can lead to the point of boredom if it's too long and it can uh, lead to completely throwing off the pacing of a scene if it's too short. So where's our balance? How do we strike that? So let's, let's try again. Let's try a third time. Try that on for size. I'll try it. Uh, <clears throat> interior apartment. Jeff trudges through his front door and he swings it shut. He empties his pockets into the basket by the door and makes his way to the table, slumping into one of the chairs. Jeff's tired. He's a few years shy of 40 and looks it. His clothes are wrinkled after a day of moving too much. His phone starts ringing. All Jeff can manage is a frown and a sigh as he realizes who it is. So how does that read? Definitely, so the um, Yeah, good pacing too. I like how you've broken them up. Yeah. So that in a, we've done a handful of different things here. We cut out a lot of the extraneous wording, so a lot of a lot of the extra descriptors and that sort of thing that really you could probably discuss with your set designer aren't included in the script, because honestly, that's the business of your set designer, and you can talk to them about all of the all of the extraneous things. Some of the details of his costume are removed, because honestly. Talk to wardrobe about it, unless it is something that is very distinct and important to the character. And it is a vital, vital that the audience and the readers knows that he wears a striped tie. It probably doesn't need to be said. We've also uh, broken up each section. This leads, uh, leads it to a little bit more of a pacing. This also can help our cinematographer see, okay, this is a shot. This is a shot. This is a shot. This is a shot. It also kind of cuts together in your head. You can kind of see this scene play out as I'm describing it because it is broken up and you can actually see the cuts yourself as you're reading it. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So when you're doing that spacing, that is basically to give you what you're seeing in the shot. And so Yes. Okay. I've been wondering why people break stuff up like that. I had no clue that that was the reason. That is very helpful. It's a way to pace things. It's a way to avoid those big meaty blocks of text. It's a way of pacing, uh, pacing a shot and also in general pacing a scene. Because the thing is, say if you, uh, if you have a moment where you're in the middle of a gunfight, right? Like Old West standoff. Just saying saying they stand across from me, they stand across from each other. They finger, they finger their guns. We, the clock strikes 12, they pull. And it's all just in one big block of text. That doesn't really, like I understand the different shots you're going for, but there's not much tension there. As a reader, it's just a paragraph telling me what happens. But if it's broken up, they stand across from each other click they uh, they're fingering their weapons clock strikes 12 they draw first one uh, gets it up first so it's like you have all of these uh, you have all of these broken up in such a way that edits the film in your head but also manages to build tension for your reader instead of having a big block of text Very cool. Yeah. Now this is all. Now this is not to this. Uh, also, this example still uses our adverbs. It still uses our adjectives. The fact of the matter is, is that he doesn't just close the door. He swings it shut. He doesn't walk through. He trudges. He slumps into one of the chairs. 
all a, all he can manage is a frown. It's all of these descriptive words that tell an actor, this is how he is doing it. This is how they are doing it. This is the feeling of this scene. This character is tired. And it's not just saying this character's tired, though we, though we do kind of put it that way. It's describing a motion and an action. So it's not, it's not losing sight of your descriptiveness, but it is also not losing sight of the fact that you are trying to pace a scene. Does that make sense to everyone? Right. All right, cool. So let's let's look at a few examples, um, different examples from from the really real world of imaginary scripts about fictional things. Yes, yes, exactly. So let's uh, well more so. Let's see how the professionals do it, because not all of us uh, are cool enough to be in Hollywood, but we can dream. So here's an example. Um, this is a, an excerpt of, from Mark Bowles' The Hurt Locker. Uh, this script won an Academy Award. So um, I, can, uh, I can just uh, read through it because it is a pretty big block. So mm. starting at the top, several U.S. infantry soldiers are moving uh, pedestrians away from the bag. Another group of soldiers is clearing out all the shops, bakery, sandwich shop, and a butcher shop. Next to the parked Humvee, three EOD, explosive ordnance disposal, aka bomb squad soldiers, are crouched over a laptop computer. Looking at the screen, the same image of metal or, of the metal artillery, excuse me, shell inside the fluttering plastic. Sergeant Matt Thompson wipes Ed the sweat on his forehead. This is summer in the desert and the median temperature on its bright clear morning is 110 degrees. It's to the left. Thompson uh, tears open a mushy Snickers. He is flush around uh, the arms and middle, but there's some real muscle underneath the flab and truth be told, after so many years in EOD, he's lost the need to have a show off build. Going left. Sergeant J.T. Sanborn uh, works the joystick on his laptop. He's a strapping Iowa farm boy with a thick back from bailing hay. In contrast to his bulky frame, his face is soft, open, kind. He has relaxed demeanor, which might lead you to think something, uh, think nothing ever bothers Sanborn. But if you thought that, you'd be mistaken. Before joining EOD, Sanborn was in military intelligence. He quit. Military intel was too easy. Up a little. Laptop screen. Rusty artillery shell now almost full frame. There? Closer. I want to see it. I, I don't I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> Zoom in on the nose cone of the shell. The third soldier leans in for a better look. Specialist Owen uh, Eldridge is a tall, lanky young man, the youngest of the group. He is a fighter like all the others, but also a reader, sometimes something of a thinker. Eldridge crouches between the other two soldiers, sipping a bottle, and eyes never leaving the screen. So as an excerpt of, a, of an Academy Award winning script, what do we gather from this? The shooting script. What you say? It's a, it's a shooting script. Yep. In other words, this is not a spec script. This is a shooting script. Absolutely. This is a, this is a way, this is a, um, not nearly, nearly as common when you are writing, when you're writing things, typically you don't put in specific camera motions. Uh, that is a, that is a much older way, older way of writing, but some people still use it for when it's specifically on set, they include shooting instructions. What else can we gather? Well, it's it's a setup. I mean, it's 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 setting up the beginning of the the film uh, with your guys, the guys, the actors that are in it, and giving you a brief description of who they are and what they are and what they're doing and how they think. 
Exactly. And their background. Yeah, their background. Yeah. So, so from the from the jump, we see that Mark Bowl is uh, he's very descriptive with his action lines. Um, but the thing is, you'll notice there are really no filler words. He doesn't use incredibly colorful language or anything super crazy there. He is just a little bit thicker with his lines because he's doing something very important. He's introducing his characters. It's he's not. Al he's, he's also um, using present tense and not absolutely, tense. which it. Which is another, which is another very, very good point. When we are writing scripts, when we are writing action lines, everything must be in the present tense. It is not that someone did something. It is not that they are going to do it. It's that they are currently doing it. They step. Someone, uh, someone steps into a room. They are not going to step. Step. They did not step. They are, they steps into it. I'm sorry, that didn't make a, mm -hmm. nearly as much sense as I wanted it to. Going but to. You get what I'm saying. As is <laughs> and not passed, not stepped. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. My brain, I apologize. It's, it's the middle of the week. <laughs> so, but you, you understand what I'm saying. We are to write, we're to write things in the present tense in order to uh, in order to create an ongoing thing, as if we are watching the film as it happens. So one another- favorite, By the way, that's one of my favorite films, believe it or not. Aside yeah. from the fact that Catherine Bigelow won the, the first female to win <laughs> the director's award. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible film and it, one of the reasons is, is because it not only has great talent in front of and behind the camera, but because it has a solid script. Of course, good enough to win an Academy Award. Well, it won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Is that it? Um, the uh, Best Screenplay is what it won. Best screen. There's a separate category for the Best Screenplay. I didn't know that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Because there's a... Because um, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman. He wrote, he wrote Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the film where Robert De Niro played uh, Frankenstein's monster as directed by Kenneth Branagh. The way that he put it is what is written and what appears on screen are two entirely different entities. Because... So uh, that was Does the most beautiful script that... I. That was the most beautiful script I ever wrote, and it was a totally terrible film. But does that mean that action lines are a significant factor in the decision for a, uh, a Oscar winning screenplay? How I would say action lines? absolutely, because the thing is, an action lines is a majority of what you're reading. A good. A good script, a good script not only has solid dialogue, but it also has a way of building, building something in a reader. It has a, it has a way of building tension, mood, atmosphere, and everything else. It has to be enjoyable to read and paint a good picture in order for it to be there. Now we can understand a character based on how they speak. That that's a, one of the ways a lot of people kind of build, especially when reading a novel. That's one of the ways a lot of people kind of build their image of a person and build an image of a character. We do it all the time speaking with the people over the phone. But the thing is, is that in order to understand how somebody moves, how they look, how they act and how their general demeanor for something is all based within action lines. In order to understand where they are, the geography of a scene, it's all action lines. If you aren't writing good action lines, you just have two people talking to each other in a room with rather pithy dialogue. Hmm. 
So um, one thing I did want to point out about Bull's, uh, about Bull's script is while he is a little bit meatier on his, intro- on his introductions, they don't really overstay their welcome. They are just, they're just long, uh, they are just long enough to kind of give us the beats, to paint a good mental picture of who we're looking at, and give, the, and give a general state of mind. So we can understand these characters moving forward in the script. Some would, some would say maybe they're a little too thick. Maybe they're, maybe they would slow down pacing. But as we can see throughout the script, he has just single action line pieces. There, are, he has a concept of knowing that time and place of where things should be. He knows when something is important. It deserves something a little bit bigger. Does that make would you, sense? Would you say along those lines that a character's first introduction in the script, especially if they're going to be, whether they're primary or supporting, requires a little extra something in terms of description, in terms of background, that you would never mention any other time, but you would mention that first time? I, I would definitely say that. As a, matter of, as a matter of fact, that sets up perfectly one of our next examples. So we are looking at a script that definitely didn't win an Oscar, but is something that is close to me, close to my heart and close to a, probably a lot of other fans of 80s action. This is an excerpt from Escape from New York, uh, written by John Carpenter and Nick Castle. So what we have here, um, if someone would read through it, real fast. This is a action scene near the beginning of the film. I'll read it. Thank uh, you. Exterior state of Lib- Liberty Security Control night. Uh, a Jeep pulls up outside the base. It comes to a stop and the driver pulls out a walkie talkie. Driver, this is the, the Gotham 4 North Bay Station 17. I have an escape in progress an object in mid-bay moving toward the wall. Tilt up, wall. Exterior close-up. Sign, New York Maximum Security Penitentiary, Manhattan Island. Continued, tilt up. Um, It's kind of odd. Continued, tilt up. Exterior wall, night. Two guards watch for the escapees in question. Exterior, Manhattan Island, night. A helicopter flies over the bay towards Manhattan Island. Exterior boat, night. The two escapees paddle, trying to get across the bay. So as Dell mentioned earlier, this is a shooting script because this specifically has a direction in how the camera should move. Of course, Carpenter often wrote his, uh, his movies and then immediately turned around and directed them. So it wasn't so it wasn't as big of a deal, but typically if you were submitting a script, if you were handing something forward to a producer or to an executive, those specific instructions wouldn't be on it until you were on set and had a proper shooting script. But so what, what can we uh, gather here? You mean what's going on? Obviously yeah, just... these two guys have escaped from prison and they are looking for them. Pretty simple. So, and you'll notice these are very, very compact action lines. I like it. (laughs) Yeah. So the thing is, is that this is a little different from uh, from where we were at the top. Like you may, you may think that this is a little dry. It's kind of like the example we had before. But the difference lies in what's happening right now. This is an action scene. There are all non-named characters, and we need to maintain a quicker pace. You can kind of see where the cuts are happening here. This is a scene that involves uh, shots that are on screen for maybe five seconds at most. So it's just one, two, three, four, five, cut. And uh, the action lines reflect that. We aren't lingering on a lot of these shots. He describes it quickly. He leaves a lot to uh, your imagination, but you can still follow what's happening pretty well. 
He uses scene settings and quick lines that set the pace of the escape, and it gives only what is relevant. What these characters look like, what they're wearing, the guards, the escapees, everything, it's not really important. Because that's more so the business of the wardrobe department, and as far as the as being a reader or being on set and trying to describe what's happening, it isn't all that important. Carpenter manages to use these lines in an effective manner to paint what is important in a scene. He only describes what is important in each shot. And it, and because of that, it keeps a good pace. So what do you guys, what do you guys think of that? Does that make well, sense? I, I like this because this particular scene in particular um, is uh, the brevity of his action lines tells us what's happening, but it doesn't go into detail because it doesn't have to. Where in the Hurt Locker, it kind of was important to know who these guys were, especially when you get into the script or into the film, you find out what difficult situations those guys ended up in. Well, and one of the other things, uh, the difference between our two scripts in that manner, in Hurt Locker, that is a very tense moment. Like, as we're reading it, you, we are kind of looking our character up and down. And we understand this is EOD. This is, they're trying to defuse a bomb. This is, this is tense. It takes time. So as a reader, the camera, the camera, that we see in our mind's eye as we're reading the script is lingering. It's taking its time. It's building that tension. When they move the joystick, things move a little more slowly. The, the scene is paced in a much slower manner because of how the action lines are written and how things are spaced out. We get to take our time. With Carpenter, with the action lines that are this brief, we're going. We are going because the scene's quicker. It's an action scene. We want to be able to really get into it because nothing slows down an action scene than a block of text. Now, but it, it doesn't it, show anything about the character's emotions. And, and in this case, you don't have time for that. You need to get the action conveyed first and then probably later on in the script i don't know i didn't, never saw this right. particular one but maybe you get a little bit more of their emotional <laughs> character well, they, i don't i think it's safe to say you don't get much emotion in uh in in escape from new york but i mean here it's this is this sets up the whole conceit i i, I don't get me wrong it's one of my favorite movies um this sets up the whole, this is like one of the first scenes, right? It like sets up the whole uh, conceit that the entire island of Manhattan has been turned into a, a maximum security prison. Yeah. And in, and in the case of Escape from New York script, there is a pretty lengthy introduction laid over a very cool vector graphic of, an, of Manhattan. One of the great um, science fiction expositions of all time. Yeah. <laughs> not I do only have I only have one problem with the script that bothers me is that the dialogue is not separated. Yeah, it's not formatted right, which is weird. It's, it throw it, it's throwing me off because I keep it's like if there's only one line of the dialogue in this entire thing and it's hard to see, it's invisible. Yeah, yeah I, I wondered about that too. It looks like an object in mid bay moving toward the wall could be could be um, another line of dialogue. Could be a that line of dialogue. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of my a only weird... problem with it. It just it, yeah, it throws me off. <clears throat> but you, funny funny thing, the total total side note from the class, that opening shot, you know the vector graphic of the city, that's not computer generated. That wasn't made in a computer. They took uh, a model of New York City, covered it in tape, and put it in black light. Um... It's it's totally wild. It it looks really good, and that and scale if you don't of New York it, is awesome. It gets reused in uh, Blade Runner as well. Yep, ah, oh, it's a that's a that's a fantastic set. It was used in a couple of films, but the old Blade Runner I know off the top of my head. Anyway, yeah. So this is a very good example of 
of a sort of action pacing. But we also, we also get to see something I mentioned earlier. There is a balance. There is a time for something a little bit bigger, and there's a time to be very Spartan. Carpenter and Castle display both skills. So here we have this from the same script. Someone read that for me. I'll, I'll read it. Hello? Go for it. Yep. Okay. Go for it. Um, exterior bus night. SD Snake Pliskin gets off the bus, looks around, and is escorted by three guards into the base. He looks like the essence of cool. His hair is long, wavy, and ratty. He lost his left eye somewhere along the line, and he's got a two-day beard thing going on. He's wearing a black spandex slash Kevlar type shirt with zippers across the shoulders and a pair of camouflage pants with lots of pockets. His jacket is a brown leather jacket that has seen far better days. And he's wearing a pair of handcuffs that have, instead of the links we're used to, a straight metal bar between them. He's not resisting anything, but the police are not taking any chances. Interior base, night. Pliskin and the guards follow a winding stairway down to the main floor. What a change, right? We, we see that Carpenter knows that the intro of his lead is unbelievably important. He wants to paint the best possible picture of him. So he allows himself to go in depth. Does he describe the guards? No, they don't really need it. They're not important. We'll leave that to the wardrobe team. Does he describe the hallway? Not really, no. I mean, we can kind of fill it in in our heads a little bit. Does he describe the bus and how beaten up it probably is? No, not really. Snake, however, he needs to be understood. And we can instantly know the kind of guy he he is based on this description we know he is world weary we know that he's a soldier we know all of we know him head to toe we know exactly what snake looks like and right after he's introduced bam right back into the right back into the action lines right back into only what's relevant yeah i mean he's very specific as to the costume as well yeah, and that's and that's the thing. Personally, from from my personal standpoint, I would never go that that in depth with with what someone is uh, specifically wearing. I would give a little bit more descriptive. I would give a little bit more like vague descriptions of what they have. But in this case, Carpenter really wanted you to know that he's wearing some sweet camouflage pants, like that he wanted to paint a very specific image of him and that's and that's sort of the balance you have to run ha being able to go to those spark those uh, much more spartan much more sparse lines pliskin and the guards uh, follow the winding stairway down to the main floor that's so a this is a, this is the first time snake is introduced in the yep. script and uh, they don't they don't take the time to re-describe Snake again for the rest of the script. Because we've described Snake. The audience knows what Snake looks like now. And in, the, and in the case of the guards and a lot of other characters in the script, they are not given the same treatment Snake is. They aren't given the same big block of text to describe precisely what they're wearing. Because, well, it's less important to know what they are. But snake is important. So that's another lesson we can learn. Sometimes not everyone needs the big introduction. Not every character needs it. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you can just put a few things uh, down to give us a general idea. Sometimes you have to be really specific. But if Carpenter demonstrates something throughout this script, it is a balance. 
it is being able to go from something that is a little more utilitarian to something that is much more descriptive. Does that make sense? Yeah, just uh, one probably trivial thing. What does S dot D dot mean? That's his initials? Yes. Or what? Okay. Yes, S D snake Pliskin. I don't, I don't recall if we ever actually learn the first and middle name, but it doesn't really matter because it's, it's call me snake. snake. Yeah. Well, I wasn't sure if it was, uh, you know, a military thing like staff sergeant or something. Or that, but never mind. Yeah. I got the answer here. Sure. So I think Carpenter runs a pretty good balance, and I think he teaches us a pretty decent le lesson about scripting. So let's move to a third example. So where Bull is very descriptive, um, but he uses his words wisely, and Carpenter uses length to determine both pace and importance, what else is there? So because those are pretty basic building blocks that can keep people, Bull can keep people interested in the way he describes things. And Carpenter can keep things interesting from a technical perspective, showing what's important, how things uh, can be paced, and also not boring us to tears by making every single line an absolutely massive block of text. So what else is there? In my opinion, there is style. Your script needs style. It needs to be fun to read. So we move on to our third example. This is a lethal weapon written by Shane Black. So if someone uh, could read this, uh, this brief little scene for me. Yeah, the problem is, is that it's, it's hard to see or I would read it. I can I've read got it. it up. Oh, go ahead. Okay. You enlarge uh, the text. Four tough looking dock workers are camped out under the pier, warming themselves around a small bonfire, laughing loudly. Christmas decorations dangling above them from the pier and empty beer cans litter the sand around them. Camera pushes in to discover an old collie tied to one of the pilings. Sorry, it is a little harder to read than I expected. Then we realize that the dog is being tormented by the dock workers. They flick lighted matches at him, shake their beers and spray him in the face. These guys are not rocket scientists. The dog, the dog cowers, tucking it, tucking in. Wait. On. Um, I think that's on. I, okay. I'm surprised there's a typo in the script. Tugging on the ropes, or tugging on the rope, tries to get away. All the great amusement of its tormentors. One of them turns, laughing. A shadowy figure strides calmly up the fire. Long hair, cigarette dangling from the lower lip. Shirt tails hanging loose below the waist. Nothing threatens his manners. He plops down beside the man smiling. They're immediately on guard. Happy holidays. Mind if I join you? Uh, punk one, yes. Punk two, fuck off. Rig smiles at him innocently, strokes the collie's fur with one hand. With the other, he reaches up a into a paper stack, produces a spanking new bottle of Jack Daniels, possibly the finest drink mankind has yet produced. Riggs, I need help drinking this. Cool. <laughs> so what so what do we see in black script that is a little different from the others well there's the line about jack daniels possibly being the possibly the finest drink mankind has yet produced um i think that's really funny uh and interesting that he would put that in there because there's no way that's going to be on the screen right i mean yeah it's, you it, are but, absolutely right. But it speaks to what you were saying, what you were just saying in that it's part of the style of the script, you know? So that, that's an interesting little detail that makes reading it more interesting, even though it won't be on the screen. Absolutely. And that's, and that's something uh, that Black is known for. A couple of other examples. Um, 
Christmas decorations dangle above them from the, from the pier. Uh, these guys aren't rocket scientists to the great amusement of it, of its tormentors, the Jack Daniels comment, all of these things, all of these things really, they aren't on, they aren't on screen, but they paint a picture and they make it something interesting to read. Um, in my personal opinion, Black is the cool kid of script writing. He writes using the principles that we found above. He is descriptive. He has a good use of words, solid line spacing and length, and he's focused on what's important. But he adds style. He adds his own voice to the script. He makes it feels like he's there pitching it to you, that he's just talking to you. Um, he remembers something that's often forgotten. We have a technical document, but... It is a storytelling document. Again, it's though we have to balance those two aspects. So every line is sharp. He uses adverbs and adjectives to drive the movement of his scene. He uses asides and off the wall word choices to convey the tone of those actions in the scene as a whole. And we also get a lot, we also kind of get to know grit rigs from just a few short sentences. We know roughly what he looks like and his demeanor without being battered by a ton of description. He shows uh, everything uh, that we've discussed while also giving us a unique voice that not only uh, shows us who the writer is, but also a little bit of the film itself. It makes it just more entertaining to read. It gives us a little bit more to work with. Well, look, and I understand not every not everyone can like really kind of jazz up their scripts and put in and put in a lot of fun asides or anything. And your script shouldn't be overly jokey or anything else because remember it is still a technical document. But Black manages to stay within all the rules and all of the things that we talked about and he's still unique. He still uh, can keep a reader engaged by using his own voice, his own vocabulary. Excellent. Is there any, is there any questions on that? Any, any part of that that is, it's a little bit foggy for anyone? All right, awesome. Uh, one one thing I do like, I love a, I love this character introduction. Just four lines, easy. Long hair, cigarette dangling from lower lip, shirt tails hanging loose below the waist. Easy. We don't know what kind of shirt he's wearing. We don't know about his pants. We don't know about anything. But just based on this, we know he's a little looser. He's he's kind of dressed down. And he is just casually smoking underneath a pier and he's approaching a couple of people that are torturing a dog. So it's like, and he's totally casual about this. That he is casual stepping into a situation that a lot of people wouldn't be. From this brief little bit, we really get to know Riggs. It's really effective from the script writing perspective. And when translated on screen, it's equally effective. Yeah, he's kind of cold character. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. It's a, it's a really good description and a great introduction because we learn a lot about him and he gets all of two lines so far. Yeah. Nice. So while those, well, the, those three scripts are a little bit more on, I would say... Hurt Locker is a bit more of a conventional choice, but the other two are a little bit more unconventional. I feel that they provide a pretty good lesson on what we are looking for in our action lines. As a bit of a review, use your vocabulary, use descriptive words, use adjectives, use adverbs. Don't just say someone did something. How did they do it? Did they do it slowly, quick to, quickly, frantically, give 
give a little bit of description. This paints a picture for your reader and your actors. It also uh, sets a tone. So don't be afraid to use your words. We also need to create our pacing. Space out your lines a little bit. Control how long those action lines are. If it's something that's a little bit slower, you can afford to, to be a little bit longer. You can afford some bigger blocks. But if it's supposed to be something that's going quick, shrink it down. If something is a, in a different shot than uh, something else you described, give it another space. This will this will uh, help people imagine what they are reading just based purely upon what they're seeing on the page, and it uh, edits the movie as they're reading it. We also want to convey our tone. We want to create mood. We want to create a state of a room without burying our readers in description. So we want to be able to use those words, pacing, et cetera, in order to actually tell our, our audience a little bit about what they're seeing or rather what they're reading for now. This also comes in with the aspect of style. Just being able to, if uh, something is kind of a little bit more on the depressing side, wax a little poetic. If something is kind of fun and jokey, be a little fun and jokey. Create a tone. Make it, make it your reader and your audience feel what they are experiencing. We also need to pick our battles. Know when to, know when to be brief, know when to describe something in detail. You need to know uh, when something is important and when something is unimportant. And really, that's one of those uh, that's one of those skills that just takes time. The more you write and the more you read through different scripts and the more you hear other people's scripts, you'll start to learn where the balance is. But it's still uh, something important to work on, even if you're just starting out. And finally, allow uh, for interpretation. The imagination is a powerful thing. It's very powerful. So a lot of the things you don't describe in a script, a person will fill in. Honestly, if you say that a room is messy or cluttered, a person can fill in whatever they want. Just describe based on uh, what, they're, what the character has described. And when you're on set, that also uh, gives the ability for your production designers, your wardrobe people, and everything else to clean things up, to make things a particular way. It gives everyone a little bit more freedom and it doesn't bog your script down. It gives everyone a little bit more to work with. The focus of your script is to uh, tell a story and it is also as a technical uh, document. So what helps both is describing what, it, what is pertinent and also letting other people do their jobs. So, does all that make sense? Yes. Do we think, do you guys think that's a fairly complete picture of, uh, of action lines for you? Absolutely, I think you did a great job, thank you. All right, mm -hmm. questions. Is there anything I didn't cover? Is there anything that you guys wanna know about? Is there any matter of pacing, description, anything that doesn't quite make sense? Um, let me ask you this. I, I have heard that a, that a, you should make a conscious effort to make a page of script translate to roughly a minute of screen time. Absolutely. Think, is that, but how does that fit compared? What is more important that the thing is paced in such a way to emphasize narrative importance or pacing important. I get that you want to do a balance of the two, but do you see them as being equally important where one takes precedence over the other? So I think there is a balance. I, I don't think one, one can take precedence over the other because sometimes things will take longer on screen. Sometimes they will take shorter amounts of time on screen. The example I always like to give in, um, I believe it's Fellowship of the Ring. There's that amazing scene where they're in the mines of Moria and they, and the stairs start collapsing around them. 
and on screen it's waving back and forth and and they're and they're throwing each other across the ledge and it's this big action set piece super memorable and the music is swelling and everyone is putting in maximum effort in the script it says the fellowship runs down the stairs it's like served. five or six minutes of screen time one action line the fellowship runs down the stairs so that doesn't quite give you the enormity of that scene from a set piece perspective however is it easier to write the fellowship runs down the stairs or to write every single tiny beat in that script in a script that's probably already 200 some pages long <laughs> well let me ask you this then so what's your take on stunt choreography what if you want to have this climactic battle this good 90 second two minute back and forth let's say a sword so yeah for some reason they're fighting each other with swords i'm assuming you're not you don't want blade for blade beat for beat so how would you describe a minute and a half of sword fight I mean, it depends on the emphasis. It depends on the emphasis of the strikes. Being able to say when someone is actually hit, it's not just a, it's not just saying strike, parry, strike, parry, strike, parry, strike, parry over and over again. It's being able to say they they clash they clash blades. They come up. They come against each other. Um. They this person moves forward. This one falls falls away it's all it's a tug of war until someone gets hit it's a it's being able to, to essentially give a brief rundown on what is happening especially in the case of something like action because writing this person gets punched then this person gets punched then this person gets punched but then this person gets punched back then this person does a spinning flying kick and then but this person dodges it's like it's maddening to read so, so more in, the tides of war than the blocking. Exactly. And in the, in the case of, of what I said earlier, leave room for imagination. L leave and room your for, your stunt stunt for your stunt coordinator to do his job. Um, however, if there's an important blow, I would say script that important blow. Um, for instance, taking one off the top of my head, the Phantom Menace. Not exactly the most popular film to say, but everyone so thinks the, the light lightsaber battles ever on screen. The lightsaber battles are really, one of the best. really, really cool. So I would say for a majority of that scene, a lot of the actual fight, a lot of the actual fight choreography, you don't really need to describe it. But what you can describe is then moving from one room to the next. You could say the fighting is interrupted as the shields come up and Darth Maul is pacing back and forth like a caged tiger in front of the shields while Qui-Gon meditates. Obi-Wan is standing there ready to go. And when the shields open, they fight again and they fight and fight and fight and fight. And then, and then personally, the only real strikes I would describe in detail is Qui-Gon swings Darth Maul brings it up, hits him on the chin to take him off guard, and stabs him. Because really? that's a really important detail. Damn. It's like, that's a really important detail right there. Spoilers for the Phantom Menace. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I, if, I ruin, if I ruin the Phantom Menace for anybody. But, and he gets stabbed. Whoa, that's important. That is a very important specific action because now the fight dynamic has changed completely and you have to communicate that. But as far as blow for blow, that gets really tedious to read and really tedious to write. Oh. Excuse um, me, my, my cat decided she wanted to say something. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Can we write that as an action line? Yes. <laughs> so, Leva, you brought this up briefly. If, I wish you could get into this a little bit more detail. What would you, what do you say is the critical difference between a writing script 
and a shooting script. And I would say specifically in the context of Charm City, where most people are going to be their own writer and their own director. I would think say necessary. And if so, what would be the differences? I would say at this small of a scale, a shooting script is a little silly. Um, at the level of, a, of an independent filmmaker, we are often working directly with our cinematographers. We are talking. We are talking with them constantly. We have nice little documents that that lay out exactly what the shots are. Um, in my particular case, especially with how with how a lot of my films have gone, where they're just in one or two different rooms, I usually just sketch out the room and I say, okay, for this scene, cameras placed here, cameras placed here, cameras placed here. This is generally how I see it. Um, sometimes you storyboard a little bit if you really want to. The thing is, is that from the perspective of it's me, it's you, me, and the DP, they're just standing right there. You don't really need, you don't really need a shooting script because the DP is right in front of you. If it's a close-up. D- D- DP is what? Uh, director of photography. I apologize. Um, okay. The director of the photography or the cinematographer is standing right there. So you can just tell him, hey, this is a close up. Follow this. This is kind of how I want the shot to work. On a big shot Hollywood production, you are not always standing right next to your cinematographer. And there are also times where the director isn't even on set or you are, or say for instance, that scene that we saw from Escape from New York, For all we know, John Carpenter wasn't there that day. Maybe it was a second unit director that filmed that. He didn't write it. So having something like that on a much bigger production is important. So typically a shooting script will will cut back on some of the more descriptive parts of of the piece. Like for instance, a shooting script might kind of cut down um, Snake's introduction. Um, At least some of the... some of the specific words. Because at that point, the wardrobe had already been set in stone. It was ready to go. You don't need to describe the wardrobe when- Exactly. Okay. You don't You don't need to describe the wardrobe in depth in a shooting script because, that's well, that's- set, bought, designed, yeah, assembled. That's, that's the wardrobe team. That's the wardrobe team's job. Now, you could that's keep actually, it in there. It's actually the costume designer's job. Yeah, yeah. The wardrobe department <laughs> as a whole. Well, they follow what the costume designer and the director wants. Yeah. All right. But generally speaking, those things are those things are set in stone. Unless specifically you wanted the camera to highlight all of those specific features. The point the point is a shooting script is a much more technical document. It lists out camera movements, it lists it lists out how long a shot is cutting lengths, um, sometimes even a focal length, all of these different, all of these different aspects of the more technical side of the house. A reading script does not include those things. And typically uh, at Charm City and on an independent level, I don't think it really makes much sense to write a shooting script. Um, Our reader's script and shooting script are the same thing. And typically our script works in uh, in tandem with our shot list, sometimes storyboarding, and the fact that our director of photography is right there and we are on a first name basis with them. Does that answer your question? So it's, it's, it's meant to be, it's meant to assist someone else directing a particular thing, but since in Trump City's case, the director is always on set, always standing next to the cinematographer, it's never yes. necessary. You don't need to give this to I like I, the, the idea of a unit director makes a lot of sense. I could see like, hey, listen, I need you to go pick up all of this B-roll and here's how the way I want it. And it, that would just be in the script detailed exactly what it's supposed to be, exactly what it is. And I'm not going to be there. I want you to know this. So here it is. OK, yeah, like, like, well, okay, I get that. I get that. And, and one of the other things is a shooting script is written after it is written in in the midst of production. The thing is, typically with a reader's script is what is made initially. 
because technically speaking, so say I have written up a screenplay for the next Rambo movie. Um, it's la ladies and gentlemen, it's Rambo six. Why, why is Stallone still doing this? The eighth blood or whatever. Um, Battle of where, the VA. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rambo. <laughs> Rambo finally goes to counseling. Um, so it's, if I was introducing this, if I was handing in this script, there's no guarantee I'm, I'm actually directing that. And to say to the person who might actually be directing it, oh, by the way, as the writer, this is how I want to be shot. Right. Gotcha. <gasps> Excuse me? My, my script is almost all action lines um, yeah. because there's not a lot of dialogue in mine. Yeah. The one I, I did for the sixth wave, the, the TV commercial. I mean, I noticed because I noticed as I was looking at TV commercials that some of them don't have any dialogue. A lot of them don't have any dialogue at all. Or yeah. if they do, it's minimum, minimal. Yeah, writing and writing for commercials is a totally advertising. Advertising, trailers, all of that is a totally different ballgame. It is, it is a different world entirely. Um, in the case, in the case of specifically film film scripts or TV scripts, yeah, the uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't include a lot of those uh, camera movements, especially if you're not directing it, because the way it is directed is the job of the director, and the director of photography. And but I'm 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 intrigued by the fact that a lot of directors cut their teeth on music videos and tv commercials you know sure teaches you the tools of the trade i mean arguably guys like michael bay never stopped making tv commercials <laughs> i mean no i'm i'm serious the fact oh. is, the fact of the matter is the man's style is built largely on commercial approaches he's really really good at that that's why I, I every think that's... single transformers rollout scene looks like a ford commercial <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's like been a trend in movies. Sure. Uh, you know, if you look at like the old black and white era, the scripts were fantastic. The dialogue was fantastic. Uh, nowadays, I've seen movies where there's hardly any dialogue at all. It's just all, you know, flash and sizzle. Well, in the especially in the case of the old Hollywood films, it they knew stage. They knew stage productions. That's what they did. I mean, the fact of the matter is when films started talking, um, well, you could argue you, uh, to, uh, to the point uh, you made about there being so much dialogue, it's when they actually started talking. It's when we had sound. Because, of course, back in the silent era, we didn't have a whole lot of dialogue because that required interrupting the action entirely and throwing in a title card. But when things actually started speaking, we had stage plays and stage plays is what we knew and stage plays has a, a lot of people talking to each other in rooms so a lot of uh, a lot of playwrights and a lot of uh, those sorts of people came in to write film scripts now of course that has gotten different over the years and uh, as uh, people got a little bit more comfortable with the medium of sound and the medium of film as a whole we got a combination of both sight and sound and that's it's not to and that's not to say overall every single film that was made in the sound era was just chock full of dialogue but mm -hmm. there were plenty that, that were i mean this goes back to wes's point and your point about oh. the um the, the 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 hobbits running down the staircase i've seen superhero movies where it's just minutes and minutes of no dialogue at all, just stuff whizzing around the screen, you know? And, and I wonder how they do that on a script. Do they say, does it say stuff flies around frantically on the screen and then they do that? How, how, how do they know how long to do stuff like that? I mean, I guess a lot of that is up to the director as they shoot or something. Absolutely. I don't, or, or maybe what you're saying is that there's two different kinds of script. There's a shooting script 
Yeah. And the initial script. And so they take the initial script and then they turn it into a shooting script. Is that, does the, does the person who writes the shooting script ever get any credit for that or? Sometimes. I mean, the thing is, it, uh, the thing is, is that I they can bring in the uh, person who originally wrote the script, um, but Hollywood also has script doctors and in-house writers and other people that kind of uh, help out with that sort of thing. Possibly the sound people. Uh, Joshua, since yeah. your piece is entirely action, your film is entirely action from beginning to end, um, is there anything like any questions you have that might help in terms of putting your thing together? Well, I think that your initial insistence that I try using that um, that other format that they use for commercials, I can't remember what it's called. Commercial script. But, huh? It's a, it's a commercial script. You're good. Keep going. A commercial script. That, that forced me to write every shot in, like, they break it down into blocks. And um, so, so um, you know, uh, what's the question again? <laughs> well, what did you ask me? I forgot. Just saying, since you had a script that was all action lines, if you had any questions that Levi might, you know, any insight on to how he might be able to clean up your script or... No, I think this was, a, I think this this class should be mandatory before anybody ever submits a script to uh, charm city because i learned a lot in this in this this evening that i didn't know and um i feel more confident about doing more dialogue in the future even though this didn't even though this didn't because uh, that question of how to balance descriptions of the shot or action lines with dialogue that was something that really perplexed me well Here's here's an example. Um, I wrote I wrote a brief, a really brief little piece. Uh, my brother, my brother is uh, making music, so very very proud of him uh, on that. He wanted to make a quick video promo, so I cut together a quick script, gave him a, gave him a, some shooting material and that sort of thing, so he could quickly film something, and then he could cut it all. And then I would cut it all together and send it back to him. So this this quick little piece, you know, it's like forty five seconds, has no dialogue, but it is a, but it is scripted with action lines in the way that I would I would typically write things. Can you make it bigger? Make the text bigger? Uh, sure. Here, let me try and. Uh... I think it's it's this. If you look in the center. At the top along the bar, the little plus circle plus. There you go. Or you could do that. That'll do that. Too. That better. There you go. So it's. See, I didn't know that I could um, have done the shots. I could have formatted it like this. I didn't realize that I could have format each shot with just a line space. Yep. It is. It's that easy, because in in the case of this. A young man is seated. He leans forward, anxious, like a spring ready to launch. That's a pretty. That's a pretty good visual. You, this person's ready to go. He taps his foot restlessly. He drums his fingers on his leg. The beat to match each other. He has a song on his mind. So that's a. That's some different shots. We're no longer looking at the entirety of this person. We're now looking. We are focused differently. That's a different shot. He glances at the clock. Nope. Different shot. Not yet. He looks forward. He quickly glances back. It's it's all based within how the shots are spaced out. And because this is supposed to be like, you know, a quick 30, 45 second promo, it's very, we're cutting. We, we have to go a little bit more quickly. We aren't really focusing on specific, uh, on the, the specifics of things. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it. This gives me an idea of um, how you would format it, not using the commercial format. Um, 
that came with Celtex. <laughs> if you want to, yeah, look, you've already submitted your script, but if you want to reformat it this way, absolutely go for it. I think that'd be really clear. Um, I'll think about it. Okay. But I mean, it's it's basically the same thing, just um, you know, in in blocks instead of lines. They, they, they have these little text blocks. But yeah, I'll, I'll think about that. I'll think about that. Sure. I'll take a look at it again. Awesome. Um, are there any other questions? Anyone else that, that would like to know some, something? Does um, everybody, I know the cast people have to know the script well and all the action lines and stuff, but what about the rest of the crew? Like lighting and sound people. Do they have to be very familiar with the script as well? I would, I would say in the case of, I would say your lighting, your lighting department and the other technical aspects, people that are moving stuff around the set um, need to be familiar with the shot list. They need to be familiar with what angles and where things are. But as far as being familiar with the script as a story manuscript, I would say no. From a technical perspective, they ought to know they ought to know the technical aspect of it. Which honestly, if you want to boil down purely your script to technical aspects, it's a shot list. It's a shot list. It's how things are going to be angled, and it is how how your shots are going to be framed, either wide, medium, close up, etc because that's going to change things. Your sound engineer really just needs to be focused on getting the correct sound clips. The people that really need to be familiar with the script is of course you uh, as yeah. the director, yeah. Yeah. your script supervisor needs to be familiar with the script or at least be able okay. to follow, follow along and say, hey, this, is, this uh, got done, this didn't get done, this got done, this didn't. And I would say it wouldn't hurt for your first your first AD to be familiar with it as well, so they can uh, certainly help out and keep things on track because your head will be on fire and you'll want to die while filming your your movie. I'm I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That doesn't always happen. Uh, there are definitely times where that happens. But <laughs> so there are a handful of the people on the set that ought to really know your script, other than your actors. But as far as folks that are moving this stuff around on the set and your grips and everything else, they don't need to specifically know uh, what the script entails. What they need is to know where they ought to be and where their stuff needs to be. Oh, I would you add, know, if I um, could, that sure. anybody, in, anybody in a design position should know about what you want to get across with your film. So if they are a costume designer, if they are a cinematographer, if they are um, the production designer, anyone involved in, the, if they're designing parts of your stuff, they should know the story, the themes, the points. And, that, and that's a very good point. Um, there's a, something I actually think about a lot and it, it's from a really weird example. The Fifty Shades of Grey movie, of all things, there is a, there was a behind the scene clip of a, of the costume designer talking about Christian Grey's different suits throughout the film. And how he's like, you see, it starts out where he's wearing this three piece suit. He's very guarded. All, every part of him is covered. Like it's a very covered up thing. But the, his second suit, you see, it's a little bit more casual. It's a little bit more open. Um, but you see, there are still aspects that are still very buttoned up. He's, he's still kind of guarded. And then he shows the third suit. He's like, this, this is a sports jacket. It is unbuttoned. His shirt is unbuttoned. He's like, he's, he's open. He's open to this idea. And he is much more, he is much less guarded toward, uh, toward Anna, uh, Anastasia, excuse me. Um, so it's like, even something as, you know, as uh, something a bit more, what is perceived as low brow as a 50 shades the costume designer understood the story arc enough to design those particular aspects showing that 
that Mr. Gray goes from someone who is very, very guarded to someone who slowly relaxes over the course of the film. So that requires him to be at least somewhat familiar with the script or for the director to be very specific in what they want from the costumes and to explain character arcs and how things change. So there needs to be a familiarity with the script from a costume and design standpoint, or there needs to, to be very specific instructions on how things are going to be. Um, well, here's, you know, here's was, the list that I made. Your cinematographer should have a script and your shot list. And your script person should have a script and your shot list. Your scripts go to props, costume designer, costumer, hair makeup, and production designers. Yep. Yeah. Couldn't have uh, said it better myself. You know, what I was um, watching carefully is like how much you put into the action lines or the descriptive part, as opposed to uh, not to get too detailed, as you were saying, because when, especially the, the script we read about the one with the, the peer and the dog yeah. under the peer, I felt in reading all that, the action lines, I felt like I was reading a story, a novel or, or, or a short story. And I wanted to know what happened. So I was wondering if there was just too much being said then. Like I felt like the whole story was laid out to me right there. You know what I'm saying? Well, the preamble. What I'm saying is that I, as a, a writer, uh, you have to know how much you should put in and how much you shouldn't. How much do you leave for the imagination as you put when sure. it becomes just too detailed? And you don't have um, to say Thing. You're talking about the escape scene, right? Um, I, I don't remember what the name of it was, but the one where the people were, the men were sitting under lethal the weapon. and they were torturing the oh, dog. Oh, okay, uh, lethal weapon. Yeah, so in that case, it lays out pretty well that whole scene. And, oh. it, and it does, and it does it in a way play out like a novel, but at the same time, there's a lot there's a lot more that technically could be said. But here's the thing. In reading that, it has flow. It has flow. It doesn't, it, it doesn't linger too long on any particular detail. It doesn't talk about all of the shiny bits on the Christmas decorations. They're just Christmas decorations. Yeah. It doesn't even specify that they're trees or snowmen or snowflakes or the baby Jesus or anything else. It's just, they're Christmas decorations. We don't need to go into any more detail. We don't, we don't know what, what all the men under the dock are wearing. We don't specific, it doesn't specifically say they're wearing longshoremen caps and torn up jackets and everything else, which- So, so Levi, is, so where do you write all that stuff? Is that, is that the other, what you say, uh, you mentioned different- Shitting script. The what? Shooting script. Shooting oh, script. the shooting, right, the shooting. So is that all that stuff is written in the shooting script? Mm, I would say no, um, because I really, all, of, all that your cinematographer and the reader needs to know is that these are Christmas decorations. These are Christmas decorations. These are, these are guys of ill repute and they're not very nice people. Um, what should be communicated in an off script setting is you go to your set designer and your costume team and you say, hey, um, I was thinking that these guys look kind of like this. I was thinking the decorations were kind of like this and you can get a little bit more specific there. But as far as the script is concerned, as far as the story is concerned, it doesn't particularly matter what the people are wearing right. or what the decorations are. Right. So all the other stuff gets told to people more than written down. Exactly. It's a, it's a different document. Um, it also helps to have, uh, have what is called a lookbook to kind of set, to set a uh, specific visual tone of what you are trying to make. 
so being able to, to hand that to your production designer and say, hey, you know, I'm building a sci-fi city. Cool. Uh, what kind of sci-fi city? That doesn't narrow it down. Is it Blade Runner? Is it Star Wars? Is it Metropolis? Is it any number? Is it happy? Is it like a, is it Star Trek future? Or is it Terminator future? Is like, what is the, this doesn't narrow it down. So having something uh, like a lookbook to say, hey, this is kind of what I'm going for, helps. Um, also using your descriptive, your more like descriptive adjectives in your, in your script also kind of helps uh, set that tone. But a lot mm -hmm. of those very specific nitty gritty type details ought to just be handed directly to those departments and left out of the script. Okay. Unless it is profoundly important. I understand. Thanks, Levi. That makes yep. it clearer. Where did you find these scripts? Google. Google. You Google insert film name script. A lot of them are available online for free. Um, that being said, some films do not have scripts. Um, Mad Max Fury Road does not have a script. It essentially has a extended comic book that they use for storyboards. Uh, Iron Man, of all things, doesn't have a script. <laughs> Iron Man has no script. They were just flying by the seat of their pants. Uh, they interviewed Jeff Bridges oh. and, and he's like, it was like being on the most expensive student film. But it's, for the most part, you can just Google any given name of any given movie and and also look up script and you'll probably be able to find it. Some of them oh, are just trans- Also, you can go to simplyscripts.com. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them are just transcriptions, though, uh, which is a little frustrating. So those how many, uh, how many of the Lethal Weapons movies did you actually watch? Um, all, uh, all of them. I've I've those. seen the, I've seen the first three. I haven't seen the the fourth one. It's on my DVD shelf. Need to oh, okay. really watch it. <laughs> I think it's on Netflix. Isn't it on Netflix or is it on Hulu? You can find it. I I have it on DVD. It's like it's right over there. Or YouTube. Yeah, I have some of them on DVD too. Yeah. But I mean, if you don't want to buy the DVD, I think you can bring it up on some of those other yeah. sites. Is there any is there any more questions on the scripts on the action lines? No, it sounds to me like each of us who are or have written scripts and we're getting better at it. I uh, might be able to, uh, and I know I would speak for myself, uh, add a little more description in, into it as opposed to dialogue only. And well, it wasn't dialogue anyhow, but uh, it needs a little embellishing. So I think in general, uh, in terms of the filmmakers, uh, it's a happy balance of descriptive lines or descriptions and dialogue. And absolutely, um, absolutely. especially uh, facial expressions, you need to write that and you need to tell your actors how, how, to, how to look, you know, tense or happy or crazy, whatever. And so that needs to be written, but they can be written very simply. And that helps me because I'm in the process of writing, rewriting again. <laughs> Sure. I'm working on. You have people in Charm City that come to this with a lot of different backgrounds. You know, some people have a solid film background. Others, like me, uh, I was a film reviewer, but I didn't know anything about script writing. Well, I'm glad to have maybe helped with some of that. So, I mean, if if there are any more questions feel free to hit me up. Um, I can put my email into the chat directly so you guys can shoot me any other questions or after the recording stops. But uh, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's it for now. So thanks for coming out. Hopefully, hopefully it was helpful. Levi, I just want to thank you. I think you did a very wonderful job. You're a good teacher. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah, good job, Levi. It was excellent. Enlightening. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Levi. It's great. You did a good job. Cool. You're here. Yep. Thank you very yeah. much. Do do everyone out in YouTube land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you oh thank you. I was gonna ask you to switch us back to yep. Do everyone out <laughs> to everyone out who